All right, hi everyone, my name is Sarah Outlaw. I'm a holistic health care practitioner and my office is Natural Health Improvement Center, South Jersey. My reason for becoming a health care practitioner is so that I could help people to get well without the use of drugs or surgery. So tonight we're gonna to talk about food. So we're gonna talk about how to ferment food. So most of our health exists in our gut, so we really wanna have really good gut health. So as goes the gut, as goes your health is the saying. So we're gonna talk about how prebiotics and probiotics in fermented foods can really help someone to regain their health and to get on a better health track. So you can follow along in your handouts. We're gonna go through the slides and talk about fermentation. So this is a very basic class. So this is basic food fermentation, sauerkraut and water kefir. We're gonna talk about, there's lots of things that you can ferment and we'll talk about that as well. But basically, fermentation is the conversion of carbohydrates to alcohols and carbon dioxide or organic acids using yeasts, bacteria, or a combination. This is under anaerobic conditions. So usually you have a lid on it. Um, sometimes, sometimes you'll leave it open like with the um, uh, sourdough bread, you tend to leave it open and have a cloth over it so it can catch all of the wild yeasts in the air. But for the most part, many of the things that we ferment, we put a lid on so they can ferment under, uh, without the air. <clears throat> so, uh, fermentation usually implies that the action of microorganisms is desirable. So, in this case, bacteria is good, funguses and yeast are good. We want those things to kind of colonize our guts. Uh, these are beneficial bacteria. We're not going to get any bad bacteria in these. This is all good stuff for the gut. So this, is, this would be a good solution if someone has to take antibiotics for some reason. They can counteract the negative effects of antibiotics by using a, a fermented food or a fermented drink to replenish the gut and recolonize that good bacteria for better health. <coughs> so ferment, fermentation sours foods and allows beneficial bacteria to begin breaking it down. And it also provides a very pleasant taste and flavor. So fermented foods are very pleasant for the most part. Some people, if you've ever tried kombucha, some people don't like kombucha because it's a little bit more sour, has a little bit more vinegar taste, but some people really, really love it. I, I love sour, so I enjoy the kombucha taste. My husband doesn't like it as much as I do. Um, he does like water kefir, and my children prefer water kefir over kombucha because it's a more um, fruit soda type of thing. It's a little bit more pleasant, mild tasting. So. All right, so why ferment foods? So fermenting foods makes them easier to digest by actually pre-digesting them. It unlocks the food's nutritional benefits even more. So for example, and we'll probably talk about this a little bit more, but cabbage itself, if you eat cabbage, it's, it's kind of hard for the body to digest. It's very rough, it's roughage at, the, you know, at its finest. So your body has to take a lot of digesting ability to get it to digest and go through your system. If you ferment it, it unlocks the nutritional value in it and it also makes it a lot softer. So it's pre-digested. It's basically doing some of the digestive work for you. So once you get it into your gut, it's much easier to be digested. And that's one of the benefits as well. It also increases the amount of enzymes and vitamins as well as producing beneficial acids. So an example of this would be lactic acid in yogurt. So the, the addition of acids to your diet will balance your body's pH a little better. So we, we're looking at a good pH balanced diet when you add in some good probiotic foods. It also improves the flavor and the texture of foods. It makes it sour or spicy. If you've ever had kimchi, kimchi is a, is a Korean uh, spicy cabbage, delicious. It's very good for the digestion. Uh, it also helps you know, keep it with warmth and all those types of things. Very, very beneficial. And then also uh, sour, like sour pickles. If you think of pickles, or some of them are fermented, some of them they just do a vinegar, and they're not fermented, but it's that sour kind of a taste. Fermentation is very, very easy. All you need is a few simple pieces of equipment and time, basically. You know, it's a time to wait as things ferment. So, what kind of foods can we ferment? We can ferment lots of things. Vegetables, flowers and grains, fruits, water, tea, condiments, dairy products, and others. So you can ferment a lot of things safely and effectively. How does fermentation work? So there's three types of fermentation that we're gonna be looking at. So lactic acid, like in sauerkraut, kimchi, dilly green beans, etc. If you've never had the dilly green beans, which I didn't have time to make, we had a busy weekend, 
Um, <clears throat> if you have uh, dilly green beans, are really, really good. Basically, it's just you use the beans and then some dill, and then you ferment them the same way. All the recipes for all those types of things can be found at realfoodoutlaws.com. I have all the fermentation recipes available there. Um, there is the ethyl alcohol, which is in beer and wine, etc. So you have you near know, the alcoholic fermentation process. So beer is usually the fermentation process as well. It ferments hops and barley and those types of things. And then you have acetic acid, which is vinegar, kombucha, or sourdough. So a kombucha is more, it's very, much more acidic tasting, that more that acrid kind of a taste. Um, it hits you at the back of a throat when you drink it. Mm -hmm. So those are the types of things that would be more of the acetic acid. So what you need for fermentation to work is either a yeast or a bacteria. That's what is going to activate your process. So yeast are wild caught from the air. So when you're making a sourdough starter, you simply mix flour and water and leave it out on the counter. It's so, so easy. After adding flour and water to it daily for a few days, you will have sourdough. So what you do, and if you look on the website on realfoodatlas.com, there's a specific recipe. So if you are if you are gluten sensitive, there is a link to a gluten free. There should be. I'll have to double check. I think there should be. The link to a gluten free version of sourdough starter on that, so you can you can actually make gluten free sourdough starter and make gluten free bread from sourdough. They say the best sourdough in the world is in San Francisco. They have some kind of a bacteria in the air in San Francisco that's they nowhere else do. in the world. <laughs> they yeah. Certainly do. So it's there and nowhere else. So people have tried to, you know, try to replicate that and they can't. So people actually ship their sourdough starter from uh, San Francisco all over the world to get that San Francisco sourdough style. There's something about it that's a specific taste that no one else can get. So um, bacteria is either introduced by a starter like whey or water keeper or by just adding salt to ferment. So with my, with my sauerkraut, all you need is salt. So it will actually ferment on its own because Cab the cabbage has its own bacteria in it, and whatever it catches from the air, it just uses that to ferment, which is really cool. So fermentation with bacteria works best with no oxygen. Examples, water kefir and sauerkraut. And also, if you have multiple things going at the same time in your house, sometimes they will cross and they will mess each other up. So when I lived in California, I always had stuff fermenting everywhere. So I would have, on, you know, I would have yogurt going, and then I'd have, you know, kombucha. I'd have water kefir. I have sourdough. I have sauerkraut. Everything. If I were to leave the lids open, they would cross and they would kill each other. Oh, so wow. they fight. <laughs> so I used to have to keep them all in separate rooms because some things would have the lid open. So I would have the sour, the sourdough open, and the kombucha would be open with like a, you know, with a cloth over top. So those two would always kind of fight. So you'd have to keep them in separate rooms. So. It's like having children that don't get along. <laughs> so you have to be mindful of that whenever you do the ones that have the open tops. So okay, so equipment is pretty. Oh crap! Can I see if I do this one? Yeah, we'll talk about equipment in a minute. So let's talk about this part first. It's not in order on your outline. <coughs> Fermenting foods, okay. So fermenting foods preserves the food and creates multiple strains of probiotics and various enzymes. So B vitamins are also created. So B vitamins are not initially in these foods, but they are actually created from the process. B vitamins are really important, especially for people who don't eat a lot of meat and aren't, aren't getting a lot of B vitamins. This is a good way to get some. So uh, fermented foods is a good way to get some extra Bs. It also produces omega-3 fatty acids, which is awesome because a lot of us are deficient in that as well. So there's B vitamins and omega-3 fatty acids that are actually produced from the fermentation process. By preserving the food, it not only prolongs the actual life of the food, but it also preserves the nutrients. Normally, the longer food sits out, the less nutritious it becomes. Since fermentation is breaking down the food into a more digestible form, the nutrients are much more likely to be used by the body versus eating the very same food unfermented. So it actually makes the food more nutritious by unlocking and getting rid of some of the anti-nutrients. So I was telling someone the other day that some foods don't like to be eaten. So 
they are there's a, some internal protection that they when they want to grow out and you know in the garden or the wild to protect themselves from birds eating them or other things so there's anti-nutrients so some animals and birds won't touch certain plants because there's an anti-nutrient well we can't digest these anti-nutrients either think of beans and some grains we have trouble digesting as well fermenting these things actually gets rid of that so when you ferment cabbage or you ferment a bean or you ferment grains, those phytic acid, anti-nutrient things in them are either lessened or eliminated. So your body can actually digest them properly without having to, you know, digestive issues. So it helps with especially if people have autoimmune diseases. All right. If your gut health is compromised in any way, which almost everyone is, you are not getting what you need out of your food. Modern agriculture makes this worse by growing fruits and vegetables in depleted soils and it is furthered by GMOs. So GMO is an entirely separate lecture that could take me an hour or two to talk about, but genetically modified organisms are, are what our food is becoming. And if it's, not, if it's not certified organic or organically grown, it's very likely that it has been genetically modified and our bodies do not process genetically modified organisms well. We actually, in the test vials that we use for the testing that we do, we actually have a GMO vial to see if someone has been exposed or sensitive to them. There are super parasites that are coming out of genetically modified organisms that actually mimic our own epithelial cells, our skin cells. So when you are testing someone for a parasite, like if a doctor or hospital is testing someone, they, won't, they never find them because what they do is they're called rope worms, and what they do is they go in and they actually wrap themselves in your, in your skin so that they become, they basically become you. It's the most bizarre thing I've ever, you know, had the privilege of researching, I guess. Um, so whenever they, they go in and they test someone with a scope or something, they can never find them because they're not, their DNA, is, it changes to yours. And it's a direct, they, they didn't exist before. This is a completely new uh, this is discovery. GMOs, right? This is from GMOs. Yeah, because they're using ge you know, genes and other things, and they're putting them in the food that don't belong there. So um, we have had people that have had rope worms, and they are not fun. Yes? So if, um, if it becomes your body, then how did they first discover them? When they were, after they were coming out of people, uh, they, they used to think, when people would do um, coffee enemas, people who had cancer, they were doing coffee enemas. They, would, they, would, they were thinking that these rope, these rope looking things was just intestinal uh, stuff that was sloughing off after the uh, coffee enema. But they realized it wasn't, these were actually worms. So they were testing them and it was just skin, it was skin DNA. But then people were, you know, the scientists, whoever was testing said, this is, this is not right. This cannot be coming from your, because it would be, it would leave you with like nothing if it was coming out of your intestines. How many layers of skin are in your intestines? They're pretty thin. Your intestines are pretty thin. But they did some further testing and they were able to kind of separate out that, yes, there is something else here. So now it's part, part you and part this thing. So I have people who have them coming out and they're, they're horrendous. They're awful. So, and it's a direct result. When I asked the, oh, I did my clinical training in Florida, and I asked them, I said, what do you, what do you think about this? And they said, this is what is going on. And it's not, it's not good. So it's directly related to genetically modified organisms. Because there's no other way for us to get those type of, that right. type of DNA in us. Yeah, so anyway, we went on a rabbit trail. So, <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and talk about uh, the differences in the par for our health second paragraph. So have you ever wondered why so many people have food allergies, food sensitivities and intolerances? This is a rather new phenomenon in the last decade or so. The more nutritionally depleted our food sources become, the less able we are to digest the food. We are essentially malnourished, fermentation can help. So malabsorption, I see a lot. I see a lot of people who eat, actually eat really good. They come to me and they already eat a really, really good diet. I look at their food log and I'm like, your diet's really clean, you eat really well, but they have all these health issues. How come? It's malabsorption. Their body is actually not able to accept the nutrition for whatever reason. There's some gut issues going on. So that's what we have to end up correcting. At the very least, 70% of health stems from the gut and some natural experts even bump that number up to 95%. So that's a lot. So if you're, all of your health is in your gut, you have to make sure you keep your gut healthy. One round of antibiotics kills your gut health for one to two years unless you restore it. So for one to two years, your body is not able to um, have the same you know, effect on your food, digesting all those types of things. So think of your immune system being depleted for one to two years. 
because of the um, antibiotics. So there's ways of con counteracting that by taking probiotics and eating fermented foods while you're doing the antibiotics. <coughs> you can actually start recolonizing the gut quicker and um, make that process of that year or two shorter, which is good. <coughs> gut health is the number one most important area to focus on to either prevent illness, recover from an illness, or for overall health. So it's really important to focus on the gut. Beneficial bacteria actually lowers the pH in the GI tract, which makes it more difficult for harmful bacteria to infect. You'll ward off illness by building your immune system naturally by eating and drinking fermented foods and beverages. So what's happening, a lot of people are on antacids and acid blockers and all these types of things for uh, acid reflux and uh, those types of ailments, heartburn. And what's happening is it's actually squashing all of the acid in the body. We are supposed to have a more acidic lower half of the gut and a little bit more alkaline stomach so that when the foods go through and they get down to the lower gut, the acids break them down so that they can pass through the colon well. If you don't have an acidic lower portion of the gut, the foods don't get broken down as much and people have more like distended, their bowels are distended, they have um, digestive issues, their food is not digesting. They'll see more chunks of food in their, in their stools and they're not able to actually get the nutrition out of their food because there's not enough acid. So all those acid blockers are making the body more alkaline to the point where it's too alkaline and they're not digesting their food properly. Plus there's a lot of nutrient induced or drug induced nutrient deficiencies from antacids that actually deplete the body of nutrition like B vitamins, D vitamins, all these things that we actually need. All right, so. Fermenting foods, so it's much cheaper to ferment your own foods than buy them at the store. So mm -hmm. bottles of kombucha are like three, three dollars or so. These are normally three or something, they were doing two for five, but it's much cheaper to make your own because once you have some water key for grains, as long as you don't kill them, they will keep perpetuating and uh, keep, you know, you'll get constant batches you'll, forever. So you can keep making batch after batch and they actually will expand so they make more. So as they make more, then you can make more more batches and more batches and then you have so many that you have to give them away because then your refrigerator is full. My husband opens the fridge like, oh, there's no room for food in here. <laughs> it's all these things. So so yeah, so it can be really fun and you can give them away and, and it can be beneficial to your neighbors. So one large head of organic cabbage from Whole, uh, Whole Foods just costs a couple of dollars and you get two quarts of sauerkraut. Bubby's sauerkraut purchase at Whole Foods is only about a quart and it's triple that amount. So, and I love Bubby's sauerkraut, it's delicious, but it's really expensive. It's over seven, it's almost eight dollars for a little jar. And you can make, I mean, you can make um, probably four jars of your own for that, probably more. So, it's very, very budget friendly. Waterkeeper utilizes one batch of waterkeeper grains that proliferate, plain water, some raisins or some cranberries, minerals and sugar pennies per quart versus upwards of three dollars for a small bottle. So it's so cost effective and so beneficial to you. <coughs> Kombucha, which I love as well, is budget friendly as well. It's just a SCOBY, it's called a SCOBY, and it can be reused over and over and it proliferates. Every bat, for every batch of kombucha you make, you get a new one. It makes a, ba it makes a baby. So you have a mother kombucha and every time you get a batch, it makes a baby. So you have all these babies. So I have all those in my fridge too. Again, just pennies compared to what a little body, a little bottle will cost. So that is good to know. All right, and then a backup to where the equipment, what equipment do I need? So that's actually, I don't know why this went out of order. I probably had a reason for this in my last class, but I don't remember. Um, most of the time, all you need is a wide mouth mason, mason jar with a lid. There are jars like Pickle It that take the air out of the jar and special lids you can purchase that do the same thing. So you can, if you really want to go high tech, there's these really cool jars. Um, if you saw the, the picture that I had for the mm -hmm. advertisement, of the, the one, it had some on there, the little cool little jars. Uh, when I put the picture on for um, the, um, not the group one, what was it? Um, Eventbrite, the Eventbrite event. So those are really, really neat. I don't have any of those. I just use an old-fashioned jar. I'm kind of cheap when it comes to this stuff. So the other things that you could use, um, uh, what I use for mine, I use strainers. I use sprouting lids, which these, I actually have these available if you don't have one. I love these little sprouting lids. It's like three bucks. Um, they help. So what you do is you put it on top of the jar. That, so when you drain your, your water keeper out, it leaves everything else in. So then you can just... 
um, put your sugar in your water and start over again without having to do this number all the time. And then you, you're less likely to lose water keeper grains all over the countertop because they bounce everywhere. So, so I really like those. And then I also use cheesecloth and then you can use a fermenting crock. So if you're using, if you're making milk kefir, you can, there's like these ceramic tan colored uh, crocks that you can put your milk kefir grains, which is different than water kefir, and your milk in, and it makes your milk kefir that way. So, and you can also use them for pickles. So I have one or two of those at home as well. All right, so let's go to, whoops. The rest of it's not on the slide, it's on your, ah, it's on your papers. So, <clears throat> let's do this. We're gonna go to sauerkraut now, first to sauerkraut. All right, so fermenting sauerkraut not only preserves it, but helps unlock the nutrients from the cabbage. It's much easier to digest and for your body to assimilate. I don't know about you, but eating raw cabbage gives me stomach pains and major gas issues. So I cannot eat very much raw cabbage because it's just my, I, my stomach will bloat because it's so hard to digest. I can eat small amounts, but not large amounts. So you don't need any special for, equipment for fermenting. All you need is a jar, wide mouth or otherwise. I like the wide mouth, but this is what I brought. And you can buy the pickling jars and airlocks, but you don't have to. That's fine too. So I end up using, so what I will use sometimes in my sauerkraut is if I have water kefir that's made that's not in fruit, I will put some of the plain water kefir in, my, in with my sauerkraut as like a starter to kind of get it moving a little bit more. So it gives a little bit more bacteria in there so it moves a little faster. You don't have to, you can just use salt and it's completely fine. It's really important that when you're making it, and we'll talk about this in a minute as well, that you let it, you do let it sit on the counter for a little while because that's when it's gonna gather up all the bacteria that it needs. Um, you don't wanna wash anything but the outer leaves of the cabbage. So you can scrub the, you can take the outer leaves off and then wash the inner layer, but don't wash the stuff that's kind of inside. Cabbage is kind of self-contained. There's really not gonna be a lot of dirt and things in there. If you see anything, just pull it up. But you want all of that bacteria and stuff in there because it's going to be beneficial to your food. So, um, let's see. So, water keeper is my secret ingredient. This takes five minutes. You take one head of cabbage. If you want it to be garlic, you can put, I make mine plain most of the time because my five-year-old my five -year -old has been eating sauerkraut since he was a little itty bitty, since he started eating food and loves it. He doesn't really like the spicy garlic flavor, so I usually do the plain for him. But um, if the adults love the garlic in there, give you a little bit extra immune boosting, which is really good. So one head of cabbage, two or three cloves of garlic, optional, half a tablespoon of sea salt, and then an optional uh, one fourth of a cup of the water kefir. You don't have to use that. So all you do is you shred your cabbage in your food processor. I didn't feel like taking that food processor out of the closet yesterday, so or the day before, so I ended up just using this and I just grated it. It took me an extra couple minutes, but it's a good work workout. <laughs> so I just use it in this grater and then you put it in a bowl and then you put the salt in there, and if you're gonna use water keeper, you can put the water keeper in there at the same time, and then cover it with, I usually a paper towel or a clean cloth. That's um, not something that's not too thick, like a thin, like a kitchen towel. That way, you're not gonna get any little bugs in there, because bugs love to fly in, especially with water keeper and kombucha, you, little gnats start to fly around, so you have to wash that and flies. So you cover with the cloth and let it sit for at least 30 minutes, and then you're gonna take either a potato masher or a back of a spoon and then just mash the cabbage until it gets nice and mushy and juicy because you want the liquid to be able to rise to the top. So it's better to use, this is not the best jar to use. So you're gonna to wanna to use a smaller jar or more cabbage. So you're gonna to wanna, to, when you do yours, um, to use a jar like this, a quart jar. This is really fizzy, I gotta let it. Um, you want to use a quart jar because you want it to actually, because it's anaerobic, you want the cabbage to go to the bottom here and you want the liquid level to be above the cabbage at all times. If you don't and there's too much air in there, the top layer may get the wrong kind of bacteria on it and it could possibly mold. So I've never had that happen except for one time there was a little bit of layer of mold. I had put it in the refrigerator for a while. So what I did, it doesn't affect anything below the line. So if you just very carefully scrape the top off, everything below that is completely fine. 
you'll notice it might turn a little bit of a, a pinkish color. That's how you know, oh, it's been exposed to air. Probably not the best thing to eat, so you just, just scrape it off and then everything below it is completely fine. You don't have to throw away the whole batch. It does not affect the rest. It's just whatever's above the water. So these little pieces that you see, I kind of did this on purpose so you can see the example. All these little pieces on the side, if it was in here for a long time, which this hasn't been in here very long, so it's fine for now, but I wouldn't eat any of the stuff that was out of the water because it was, it's not, it's not gonna be fermented properly. It's just kind of like sitting in the, and that's actually probably rotting, you know, oh. so it's not underneath the, 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 um, the water line. So what you do is you leave it on the counter for uh, three days after filling the jar to one inch below the rim with the cabbage. If you're having trouble keeping the water above the cabbage, you can take a cabbage leaf a whole one and shove it down in there and then that will help to hold it down a little bit. And sometimes people will put a rock in there. They'll take a, a clean rock and they'll put a rock on top of the cabbage leaf to keep it down. Because some people really have a hard time with keeping the water level down. So whatever you have to do to keep that little bit of water above the cabbage, that's good. So three days, I prefer three days. I don't like my sauerkraut too sour to begin with. When you put it in the refrigerator, it will continue to ferment. So then you don't have, you, It'll, you'll get a little more sour, but you don't have to leave it for more than three days if you don't want to. You taste it, and if you have it as sour as you want it, you can move it to the refrigerator, and if, you not, if not, you can leave it on the counter. Some people leave theirs on the counter for up to six months. You just keep it, you know, just keep tasting it or whatever, and it gets really fermented. You have to be careful because these will, um, the air builds up, so you have to watch the build up because it will blow the top off of your um, jar, so you have to watch that. So every once in a while, you just get a little, a little burp, Little bit, okay. and then it lets the air out, reseal it, and then you're good. So you just have to keep an eye. So it's like having, like I said, it's like having children. You have to keep an eye on them, babysit them, or they will have a meltdown. <laughs> so, so yes. So always be sure, like I said, be sure the liquid level is ab above the cabbage. Place a cabbage leaf in the jar to push it down if you need to. So very, very, very simple. Um, all right. So any questions about sauerkraut making? I'll let you guys taste this in a little while. Pretty easy, huh? I have a question. Yes. Does it have to be a glass bowl or can it be stainless steel? Stainless steel, metal seems to have a reaction with the fermenting process. Okay. So we try to keep metal away. So even the ball jars on the underneath, they have their cover, they're coated mm -hmm. in like a something. So it seems that once it starts fermenting, that there is a, some kind of a chemical reaction with the fermentation and the metal. So okay. we try to keep that out, away from it. So it's better to do glass or ceramic. Those okay. are the two things that are the best. So if you have any questions about sauerkraut that you think of, feel free to ask me. We're gonna move on to water kefir. Water kefir is a fermented drink cultured with kefir grains. The grains are made up of various strains of healthy bacteria and yeast. The strains are held together in what is known as a polysaccharide matrix. They feed off sugar and multiply. The result is a probiotic fizzy drink that is healthy and beneficial to drink daily. This is even safe for children, it's safe for everyone. So the only, I'm gonna put a caveat in there. If you have an autoimmune disease that makes you sensitive in any way to histamines, fermented foods may not be your best friend. So people who have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, sometimes they have a, a histamine issue. Some people who are on an autoimmune protocol they ha and have known histamine issues, uh, they will, will most likely have trouble with fermented foods because they tend to be higher in histamine. Same with bone broth. Bone broth that you make that has been sitting for a while tends to be higher in histamines than something the bone broth that you drink right away or eat right away. It's kind of a fine line between healthy and then something that's gonna trip your autoimmune issues. So um, it's, it's usually if you feel worse after you eat or drink a fermented food or beverage and you feel itchy or rashy or irritable or bloaty, if something's happening that's not supposed to happen, then you might be having a histamine issue. Some things are gonna be normal because your body, if your body's not used to this, then you wanna start really small and work up to it because your body has to build up um, some tolerance to the probiotics because you're gonna have a detoxing effect. Some people do. So that's something to keep in mind. Most people are okay, but if you have autoimmune issues, you might have a little bit of a trick there. So um, adding probiotic foods to your diet will help heal the gut and keep it healthy. Digestive disorders like Crohn's disease, irritable bowel syndrome, and yeast infections. So these are really, really good for digesting for digestion issues. You mean uh, the the pro oh, probiotic foods? I thought you meant probiotic supplements to the. You don't add probiotic supplements. Correct. To the they make their own. Yep, they make their own probiotics. Okay, so there's a couple of ways to do uh, water kefir. 
So there's a first ferment and a second ferment. The first ferment, you need a wa the water key for grains, a quart size ball jar with a sprouting lid or a plastic strainer. Again, we wanna uh, not want to use the metal. A large measuring cup filtered water. Chlorine kills the grains. So if you have chlorinated water, tap water, it's gonna kill it. So the best way to get away with that, um, if you don't have a water filter, then you just boil the water and let it cool. And that's, that'll take care of that. But boiling the water will get rid of the whatever's yeah, the chlorine. Or you can just let, uh, you can always put some on the counter and let it sit overnight and the chlorine dissipates. But the best way, the cleanest way to do it is to just boil the water. And then just make sure that the water's not too hot because hot water kills the grains too. They're very temperamental. <laughs> Where do you so. get the keeper? I have some here, or you can. You usually have to get them from someone who has them, because there's no, or you can buy them online, dried up, and then you just reconstitute them. There's no way to make them yourself. They have to come. They've always come. So every keeper grain has come from somewhere, from somewhere, from some for years and years and years. You cannot make your own, which is kind of interesting. Kombucha, you can make your own because you can get kombucha, and then it'll make it. There'll be like a little. Uh, some of the little strands of the kombucha in the bottom of the bottle, you can strain them out and usually you can grow your own. But Waterkeeper, you have to get it from somewhere else. And even this, like if you got a bottle of Waterkeeper, you, there's no Waterkeeper grains or anything left in here that would make more grow. So you have to get the actual, they look like this, they're white, they're clear or white, opaque. Um, that's what they look like. You can get them online? You can get them online mm -hmm, or you can get them from people. Uh, there's, um, I'm trying to think of who has them. Bodyecology.com has them. Also, uh, Cultures for Health is another one. I think it's, it might be Cultures the number four health. I can't remember. But they, they have them and you can, um, you can get them from there. You can also get them from Amazon, I'm sure. Like, they from, you can probably get them from Amazon. So, um, okay, let's do, see. Do we look for organic keeper grains or just? Just regular water keeper grains. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's what's in these jars. Um, let's see. So to make one, okay, and so you need organic, a liquid minerals, which I like because if you're using filtered water, it usually takes out most of the minerals from the water. Mm -hmm. So the water kefir grains like minerals to proliferate. So I usually just, this bottle will last for years, but I usually just buy a bottle that's from um, vitamin, vitamin shop or Wegmans or Whole Foods. It's the trace minerals, constant trace, trace mineral drops. And this bottle will last you forever because you only need like three to five drops per batch. So it's very, very easy. Just add a little bit of mineral so that they actually can culture a little bit better. Optional, again, is organic raisins or other organic dried fruit. Sulfur from a non-organic dried fruit kills the grains. So again, temperamental grains, they die. So they won't, they won't work. I try to find <coughs> organic fruit that's not, that's unsweetened. I don't like to have sweetened or I don't like to have ones that have oil so this one I got it's just cranberries and apple juice concentrate in that they use the, the other organic so this and these were kind of expensive which I don't like to buy the expensive ones but the only other ones that Whole Foods had were organic sweetened cranberries and they had oil on them too so I don't want that and it would work but it was sweetened with um it was the oil that I was didn't like it was like canola oil or sunflower or something I didn't want to want that in my because it'll make them, it'll make it oily. You don't want to drink oily water. It's gross. So, um, okay. So then you, to make one quart of water kefir in the quart jar or measuring cup, mix one fourth of a cup of the sucanat, or is, which is sugar, or evaporated cane sugar. That's just regular organic cane sugar. Um, don't worry about the sugar. It gets eaten up with some warm water and dissolve. So, I used to do it with a little bit of the warm water because the sugar would dissolve easier. I'm lazy now, so I just put cold water in there and I just stir it until it's done, until it's dissolved because it, it was a pain. I would have to warm up the water and then go back and forth and it was t it took me too long. I don't have time. I live in a farm. I'm too busy. <laughs> fill, then you just fill with the cool water about an inch from the top if working with the ball jar. As long as the water is no more than lukewarm, add the water keeper grains. If working with dehydrated grains, follow the instructions in the package. So if you have a, de a bag of dehydrated ones that have been dried out, you have to reconstitute them and get them working again, and then you can make your water keeper grains. I always add a few organic raisins or the liquid minerals um, and or, and then also sometimes I'll just use cranberries if I have those. The, the raisins at Whole Foods last week didn't have good stuff in them either. 
Then you place the lid on the jar and set it on the counter for 24 to 48 hours. I usually open the lid once during the ferment to let it burp. The fizz produced by the fermentation process causes the pressure to build up in the jar and it's best to release it. You'll know it's because it'll be, it'll get really full. Sometimes, I, one time I left it and it actually, it actually bent the, it actually bent it. It was so much pressure. So yeah, it eventually can pop it off. So you have to watch because then if you, um, you don't want to open them, it's, it's rare for them to get that bad, but it, sometimes they get so fizzy, you have to make sure you open it this way because then stuff pops out. So you just have to watch it. It's usually not that bad, but it could get that bad. If it gets really hot, so in the summer, the hotter it is, the faster they ferment. So if you're not paying attention, sometimes they can get really build up the air, the pressure. So, so the, fec the second ferment is my favorite because that's when you get to actually flavor it. So it has a kind of a nice flavor, very mild flavor on its own, but then you get to put fruit and other things in it and actually make it taste really, really good. And this is when the kids really like it. So I've made this for parties and put it in, you know, one of those big, um, you know, the punch containers that have the spouts, and people love it, yeah, yeah, and people actually love it. It's slightly alcoholic, this is very, very slightly, not enough to do anything, but it has that kind of a wine cooler-esque type kind of a flavor, um, because the fermentation, you're fermenting. Do they have rats in the building? It's geese, oh my gosh. I like geese. <laughs> that was really weird. Oh my goodness. That's funny. <laughs> I'm thinking there's a bank here on the Elephants. Uh, quick question. Mm -hmm. Is the second ferment optional? I guess that would be optional. It is optional. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's optional. You don't have to do it. Um, you'll, you can, it'll be fine with the first ferment, but to get even more probiotic activity, you do the second ferment. Gotcha. So for the second ferment, you can, I like to use frozen fruit. Or if I'm using a lemon lime flavor kefir, I don't use a frozen, I just use lemon and lime, and I just kind of squeeze the lemon and lime in. So that's fine. So the frozen fruit infuses the water better than fresh, so it actually, because the frozen fruit tends to have its own water in it, when you put it in the water kefir, it kind of sucks all the essence out, whereas regular fresh fruit, it just seems like it stays more. It doesn't, it's more compact, I guess. It's not as porous. So it's, it seems to taste better with the frozen fruit. So I just get some frozen organic fruit and do it that way. So then you open the jar, the jar and, and take out the rehydrated fruit. So what you do is you just, I usually get a spoon and just scoop out the cranberries or the, or the raisins and get rid of those. And then you take another jar and I usually use the sprouting lid and then I just pour it into the other jar. So then you have just clear liquid in the clean jar and then you have all of your water kefir grains left in the jar, on the other jar, to start over again. You put that to the side and know that you're gonna, as soon as you're done making your new batch, you, you finish up the other batch because you don't wanna leave on the counter because then they'll die. So you have to continue, yes. Yes, you use them over and over and over and then they grow and grow and grow. So you'll, they'll multiply in the jar as you go through. The warmer it is, the faster they multiply. So eventually the jar will be full. You only usually want to get let it get to about half full and then change it to another jar. So we'll start with few people will start with one jar with the water kefir grains and then every bat every couple of batches they'll end up with a new one and a new one and a new one. Then you can make multiple um, jars, which is really, really cool. And like I said, the warmer it is, the faster they multiply. Mm -hmm. You just want to get don't want to get too hot because then they oh, they die. So, uh, okay, so then using your sprouted lid, sprouting lid or strainer, strain the key water keeper into your measuring cup or another glass jar. Keep the grains in the original jar. No need to rinse them between uses. Every once in a while, it might get a little bit of an eggy smell. You might want to rinse them off a little bit then. I don't know why that happens. It just has something to do with air or something. Um, it doesn't mean that they're bad. Usually you just have to maybe give them a quick rinse and then um, preferably with filtered water because you don't want the chlorine to get on them. Put a few pieces of your fruit of choice into the water keeper and add a few more raisins if you would like. Some of our favorites are pineapple mango, strawberry, raspberry, banana, and blueberry. Sometimes I add a pinch of baking soda to help increase the fizz. I did that with these. You put a little bit of baking soda, just a little pinch, and that helps with the fizz. It helps a, a little bit more of a chemical reaction, which is nice, more of a soda type of uh, flavor. And then you want to put it on the counter for another 24 hours or longer. If you want a more sour water kefir, then you would put it on for longer than 24 hours. And these times are variable depending on temperature. So 
So this time of year as it's getting warmer and my house is much warmer than it was in the winter, um, it's gonna be faster. So in the winter time, sometimes it'll take two or three extra days for the second ferment before I feel like it's actually water kefir that I wanna drink. So, and then if you're only doing one ferment, you can let it ferment a little bit longer as well, just so it's the desired flavor. Just go by taste. Some people like it a little sweeter, some people like it a little more sour. I prefer more sour because that means that more sugar has been eaten up. So the more sour, the less sugar content in there. So. So you're saying the warmer it is, that it'll sour quicker? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. When the second ferment is to your liking, strain out the fruit and store in the refrigerator. The water kefir will become more fizzy with time, so be sure you let it burp now and then if you store it for any length of time. I drink mine frequently, but if you don't, it will keep in the fridge for at least a few weeks. So it keeps really well. You just have to watch it. You'll see the, um, like this, so see, you can't push it down. It's been in here since this morning when I put the, I only did the second ferment for today because I was, um, didn't have time to do it yesterday. So it is becoming fizzier and fizzier. I put a little bit of baking soda in there too. So it's about time to open it up and let it burp. But I would probably leave that if I was going to be drinking at home. I'd leave it another full day. I burp it once, leave it on my full day, because it's gonna still be pretty sweet. Some people will eat the fruit out. It's it's very fizzy. It gets very it's very soggy and fizzy. The fruit. So some people like it. My kids, some of them will eat like the blueberries. Sometimes they'll eat the mangoes, um, and it's probiotic. It's getting probiotic fruit that way. So it's good. All right. Any questions about that? There's an extra page in the back if anybody wanted to take notes. Or I forgot about that. So. Um, just to recap, all you need is basically what's in your own kitchen for fermenting. And then um, if you want to have a sprouting lid, they're always, they're always fun to have because it's left mess. And Where do you get those at, the sprouting lid? I get them from the Frontier Co-op, so I just get them in bulk. But you can get them. I have a bunch of them here. You can get them here. They're like three bucks. Okay. Um, and they're, I really like them. They really, they're really good. They're for, um, for sprouting, like sprouting beans, sprouting grains, those types of things. But they really good. They have little holes, so you just kind of pour the water out. So they're really nice. And again, this is e available pretty much anywhere, Vitamin Shop, Wegmans, which is really easy. There's lots of good fr food fermentation books. A couple of them are checked out. There's a Food Fermentation for Dummies by Wardy Harmon from Gnauflins. She has a blog. It's called Gnauflins. And um, she has a really good book on fermentation. And there's Wild Fermentation, which is this one. You can go on my blog, which has the fermentation stuff on there. And um, if you just put up, you know, put in fermentation, it's, there's so many now because it's, it's very popular now. So you know, there's tons and tons of websites, tons and tons of different ways of doing it. The one other one of our favorites is the, there's carrots, there's ginger, ginger carrots that are fermented. They're really good too. It's a good way to get the kids to eat carrots more. So that is another option as well. Any questions about yes? I feel like I'm just having trouble visualizing with the grains. Mm -hmm. Like. When you say to make one quart of water keeper, and the, you know, so you have the directions, and then it says to add the wa the the grains. Mm -hmm. But then you're saying that it has different amounts because it grows. So I'm confused. Right. It won't change the level of the water. So for example, if you are, let me move this over. So for example, to make so pretend this is empty. There's only a little bit of water. So what I did, so pretend there's only the water keeper grains. So the water keeper grains are in your jar. So you can see them, they're at the, the, the red is the cranberry, the bottom they're white, you can kind of see them, they're white. Um, this is about, what, how much is this? Just about a half a cup of them. So that's usually really all you need, like a half a cup to start. Half a cup of the, well, the water keeper grains is usually sufficient. They will, they will expand, but it doesn't, they, they don't seem to affect the level of the water. So when they expand in there, it's fine, they'll just expand as needed, and they absorb some of the water too, so that's totally fine. So you just put those in, and what I usually do is I'll put, um, I'll put my sugar in on top of the water keeper greens, and then I add in my water. So I'll add the water up all the way up to the, the ledge here. Then I will take a, I usually take a bamboo skewer or a chopstick, and I stir it until the water is dissolved. And then I will put three to five drops of the trace minerals and a few raisins in and then I put the lid on, and then I just let it sit. And then the next day I'll check the lid, and if it needs to be, if it's already fermenting, I'll you know just do, you know, pop the lid a little bit and put it back, and then leave it. So I will leave it for as many days as it, until I like the way it tastes. And then I just take it, I put the lid on. So you're actually drinking 
keeper I'll take a little. Um, they go. They always go to the bottom. Okay. So you can just so take a little spoon. That actual fluid. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Taste it. Mm -hmm. okay. I'll usually just take a little spoon and then just taste it out of there. Okay. And then I'm like, ah, and I'll leave it a little longer. This one, if it's too sweet or it's not fizzy, it's too syrupy, it has to go longer. So then after you're done, you and you, all the little cranberries or whatever are floating on the top, you can take a wooden spoon, or I have a smaller one that I usually use, and I usually take all of the little, the little cranberries out, and I throw them away or put them in the compost, and then you put the green sprouting lid on and take another empty jar. This one I couldn't use because it's a, a small mouth. I usually have a, one of those um, canning funnels mm -hmm. that I've left at home because I was using it this morning. But I put that on to help me not splash it everywhere. And I just pour it in and then you have completely clear, there's no water keeper grains, it's like just like looks like colored water in your new jar. And then you take your frozen fruit and you add it to that jar. And you can put your pinch of your baking soda in if you want. Seal it up and then let it sit again. And then you're good. And with this one, so then, then you have a new jar of, and so you have more grains that you need to. So you need to do something with those, right? So if you leave them, they will die. So you put more water and more sugar and more cranberries or grains if you want to and more minerals and then let that one sit. Okay, and then so, go on. So this would die like this? There is sugar in there, so that would be okay for a day or two like that. But when you get home, you probably would want to fill it with water and put um, like two to four tablespoons of sugar in there. Okay. Yeah, and then it would be good. So, so yeah, so that is the process of, and then you'll see if it starts, if they start to expand and they go above, um, they go to a cup or so, that, or a cup and a half, you can kind of eye it up and then you just pull them out. Just, you know, scoop some of those out. That's what I did because I ended up having five or six jars um, of these, I had one big one. I had one big, a whole, one full one of this, and I split them up into five. And now they're expanding, so then I split those into their own. And then you just kind of keep going. And if you don't want to deal with them, if you're like, okay, I don't really need ten thousand <laughs> jars of water keeper on my counter, you can put, combine them all into one, and you'll fill it up maybe to like maybe like here with water keeper grains, and then put sugar water in there, and then put it in your refrigerator, and then they go dormant. When they're in the cold, they go dormant, which means they're not going to keep getting. It's not going to keep fizzing. It takes a couple of days to do that, so I would burp it maybe once or twice in the fridge, but then they go to sleep, and then you can wake them back up when you take them out. The cold makes them to sleep. And how long does it take to wake them back up? Um, usually a couple of times. Sometimes once if it's warm enough. So I actually turned, I have a warmer, uh, I have an electric stove, so I have a little warmer zone. So I put all the jars in the warmer zone to kind of wake them up a little bit. So it's the temperature is really, it's low, but it's not cold. So it's like a warmer than it would be room temperature. So probably like 70, 75 degrees it ended up being because my house was, was a little chilly. For and then um, I did it for a day. Okay. And I woke them up. We just put them on the counter. It might take two or three or four days. You'll know because it, then it'll start, they'll start to wake up and you'll see the bubbles in the jar. You can see it. the bubbles will stem from the bottom. You can probably see a little, probably not, maybe not. The little bubbles will come from, there they go. Um, you, when you tilt it a little bit, you'll see the bubbles go up to the top and you know that it's actually working. So these have been asleep for... I don't know, probably since the fall, and we woke them up a couple okay. of days ago. Yeah, so they're pretty, they're, they're, even though they're easy, it's easy to kill them, they are pretty, I feel like they are pretty adorable because they, they go to sleep for months and months and months and then they wake back up as soon as they get a little bit of sugar. As soon as you feed them, they're like bears. <laughs> Hibernate. So they go dormant. Yeah, they go dormant. Mm -hmm. So how much sugar should they put? I mean, to put them to um, sleep, how much sugar? I usually put? just put the normal amount, I'll put two to four tablespoons in, depending on the size of the jar. And that, that's usually enough to just let them feed off of it in the refrigerator. And then it takes them so long to eat that up when they're going dormant that you don't really have to worry about replacing it. So if you go on vacation, you can put them in the fridge while you're on vacation and take them back out when you're... And the jar needs to be filled over with to, almost to the top mm -hmm. to make them dormant. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I always fill it up so that they have plenty of room. Okay. So they have plenty of room in there. Yeah. And then you don't have to worry about changing them when you make them dormant or anything mm -hmm. like that okay no if it's going to be really long time and i think they might have eaten up all the sugar that's in that bottle i might test the water and see and see if it's if it's any if there's any sweetness left at all if it's completely like tastes like regular water i might throw some more sugar in there for them okay. if it this is like if it's like you can leave them in there forever you just have to make sure they have a little bit of sugar to feed on or throw in a couple cranberries something for them to actually be able to survive on because you don't want them to die completely without any food. Okay. So, so yeah, so that's pretty much it.
So I do have a little bit that I am willing to share, no problem. Um, if you want, if, if I run out, because there's probably only enough for two batches for two people, I always can get you more, because I have probably five or six more batches at home that have, are ready to go. So, and I'll be making more. My kids, my, as soon as I, my kids saw the jars and they knew what I was doing, they're like, because oh, they love water keeper. It's like the thing. Because we don't drink soda in my house, so this is like, you know, they, they like to flavor their own. So everyone has their own favorite. You know, I like, I like cherry. I eat the frozen organic red cherries. I like cherry. Um, I will put a little, I'll make mine cherry vanilla. So I'll put a little bit of vanilla extract or a little bit of vanilla stevia in it and the cherries and it's like a cherry vanilla soda. Oh, it's okay. really, really good. So you can, it's really enjoyable and you know you're drinking something healthy. Your kids can drink as much of it as they want. Um, you'll know when they've had too much because they might get a little bit of the runs or whatever, but their body builds up a really fast tolerance to it and they, they absolutely love it. I think it makes their stomachs feel good so that they want to drink it more. That's okay. what I think, because the kids really seem to love it. So, any other questions? All right, so feel free to visit the blog that has lots more information, other things to ferment, kimchi's on there and stuff. Yes, do you have a question? No. Okay, do you have a question? Is there kombucha on the blog? Mm-hmm, yeah. And I do have some kombucha scobies. They have, they've been dormant for a long mm -hmm. time. They're in the back of my refrigerator. I'll have to revive some of those and see how they work. What's a scoby again? A scoby is a, with a little like a kombucha, almost like a mushroom. It looks like a oh, mushroom. Okay. Um, that's to make kombucha. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Thank you. It's a symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast. It's a scoby, S-C-O-B-Y. It's an acronym. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an acronym. Mm -hmm. yes. Pick it up and look it? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, so that is the, uh, you want to yeah, yeah, yeah. I live in the Uh-huh. Right? Yeah, sure. Do you think it'll be worth it? Yeah, I'll be here. <laughs> I gotta clean up all the stuff anyway. Okay, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. I'll see you in a few minutes. Okay, so the keeper grains are actual grains? They're not, or they just call them that. It's actually a colony of uh, bacteria mm -hmm. and yeast that come, they are uh, uh, circular. Okay. Is there a preference of which is better, the cranberries or the raisins? No, just whatever you can get that's more of a, that's, that's, not, that's not sulfur, like an organic. I so would. Yeah. I'm gonna take, let me take the cranberries out of this, and I'll, pour, okay. I'll just pour this in your jar. Okay. Yeah. Let me just do that. You're welcome. I'm gonna pull these out and throw them in the trash. Now these have only seen one batch. They've only been through one batch since they were dormant, so they might need a little bit of TLC to get them to keep going well. Okay. If they're just kind of like, oh, we've been on the break for six months here. <laughs> Can I purchase that all I would sprouting lid? Sure. Okay. All I would do is um, add sugar to that and sugar and water, correct? Mm-hmm. Sir, can you use the trace mineral um, drops just in regular filtered water? Yes. Yes, that will work nicely. Okay, so I have a couple pieces. Thank you so much. Do you know what it might be under? Do you want to just add? Do you want to just add it? Yeah, I can do that. Session two. Yes. Can I kind of mind the stuff with like dead metal and stuff like that? And I realize mm -hmm. I have a whole bunch in my yard. Mm -hmm. So like, do I just rip that out with the root, or do I cut it? Um, you usually will cut it and then look up online like what what do I do with dead metal? There's a ton of recipes. Yeah. Yeah, but you would just cut it from the, the cut it at the root. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, I was waiting for the Is this this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can buy it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I got that at Whole Foods. It was two for five. So you guys are welcome to taste these. I will put. Um, I'm gonna put. I'm gonna put it in here like this. Yeah. So some of it. Yeah, it's gonna smell kind of fruity, fruity and fizzy. It's, it's, it's uh, it smells somewhat alcoholic. Yeah, she has a 
Okay. Okay. Both times, you're welcome to try both times. Can I take this? This is the berry. Yes. And then we have the. What did you make here? Is that pineapple? I'll try a berry. This is mango pineapple. It's nice. It's mm. nice, and people oh, people always ask me, "What is that?" When I have it at parties and stuff. Like Katie would definitely know that one. <laughs> <laughs> and this is only one one. Um, you know, this has been out of the fridge like once. Yeah, one okay. cycle. So it's, it mm -hmm. actually did okay for only one cycle. I was worried because I didn't get it. I was going to try to do it early. You know, let's do a okay. couple batches yeah. and like. Can I try the berry? Yeah, sure. Everybody has their preferences on what kind of like. Yeah. You can use the same. Thing. Sure. Okay. And how long have you been doing fermentation? Mm -hmm. Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> trying to think. Since 2010 or 2012, I think. Oh wow. Yeah, a long time. Um, can I try the bird? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very good. Kaden would like this. <laughs> yeah, I think she. I think kids really seem to take to it. Yeah. That blending line. Oh, wow, that's really good. Oh, yeah. These are my This one's mango, so pineapple mango, and this really one is uh, blueberry, is strawberry, and so raspberry. Oh, that's really good. Yeah. And yeah. how long oh, did you, like, how long so has the fruit been in there for? Just since this morning. Nope. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. oh, I put it in this morning. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it really it sucked it. I left it on the counter for all day, and I then at um, about 5.30, I put it in the refrigerator. The frozen fruit kind of chilled it anyway. It was actually warm because I had it on the warmer, so I was trying to get to ferment faster before the fruit went in. And the fruit went in, and it cooled it down. And then I put it in the fridge at 5.30, so it had, it really only had maybe eight or nine hours in the, in the, oh, in the okay. fridge. So it's it's really fast and, and it was warm. I mean, today was pretty it was pretty pretty warm in here. It was pretty warm at home, so we had a good fermentation. Now, if you put a bottle of this, can this help start? It only it only does it with kombucha. Water kefir doesn't doesn't start. Um, it won't work. It doesn't have any of the green in there. So you can taste the difference if you want to taste. See how fizzy it is. So it's, see how fizzy it is. And I've then had. you said you put a pinch in both of these of the baking soda? Uh, baking soda, one pinch. That's it? Yeah, yeah. So if you got a hand on it, it's on the hand on Yeah, it's on, it's on there. So it should be, just uh, follow the instructions. It should be. And if you have any questions, you can always email me or call me. Um, now, is Arm and Hammer okay, or do you prefer? You can use Arm and Hammer. Okay. Just any kind of baking, just a little bit, a little pinch of baking soda. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. It's okay. It seems to really help. So it, really, it really does help with the fizzing of it. Okay. So I, I, I like it. So and this actually will help you, like, okay. if you have a duck. Mm -hmm. I feel like I but if there's something wrong, mm -hmm. and I've been, like, going around and around with my yeah. doctor to the point where my husband's like, we're not using him. So yeah. We're just not she, going. Yeah. Like and um, he oh, has, um, because he has high blood pressure. Yeah. And he's got high blood pressure. Where to go? We both just don't feel like mm -hmm. ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just don't feel like Yeah. And so she, she yeah, like I used to be like sick. in really great shape, but and just right after doctor, doctor, and then they now I feel like everything is so tight. It's just like yeah. Even when I eat, it's like so I'm in good. You know, even when I don't eat good, it's not like one affects the other. Right. Not to say like any excuse. Like I'm agreeing. No, we enjoy it. We're more like. So Even when I eat healthy, it's very frustrating because it's like issues like when <laughs> right, right. right. Too, you know, yeah. and I still so have still the same or even just issues. Yeah. So it's like, oh, where yeah, do you start? Is this a good thing to start? This is a good start. Yeah, and I'll give yeah. you a flyer like, for the other ones. You know, Let me go ahead and close this out. So you can use the other 